If you have a name like Sam Adams, sorry, sorry, blame your parents, it's their fault. They didn't know about this back then, but I'm sure parents will now start naming their children after available domain names. Um, so you can create a website or blog. I started with my blog back in, uh, as a high school project. It was uh, jacobcurtis.wordpress.com. Um, so ultimately I finally uh, kept checking and, and waiting until the hosting dropped on uh, the Jacob Curtis baby site and I swooped that up right away so finally got that. Another thing that's important about earning, uh, owning your personal brand is that um, it's very competitive. A lot of people are getting a uh, they're, they're understanding the importance of this so if you do have a competitive name Owning your social profiles, like things like securing your vanity URLs, are going to become increasingly important because people are going to be fighting after them. Um, my Twitter handle, for example, is Jacob K. Curtis because uh, there was another Jacob Curtis in Anchorage, Alaska, who was a news producer. That was uh, he had secured the name, and I remember when I had first started my Twitter account at five followers, I hit him up and I said, "Wow, congrats on getting the the, the name." And he said, "Yeah, sucks for you, doesn't it?" Now this same guy, now that I have 35,000 Twitter followers, uh, he's the one mentioning to the people who accidentally mentioned him as the wrong Jacob, mistaken identity, saying, no, it's not me, it's this Jacob you want to talk to. So great to rub it in his face now. Owning your face. I just love that. Own your face, guys. This means having a recognizable profile picture, okay? Um, you'll see my profile picture currently. Look a little bit younger because I don't got the beard on. But what this is going to do is I recommend having your, uh, the same profile picture across multiple social channels. So this way it really does build that name to face recognition. A lot of the time you'll see, uh, say, when you're going through a blog and then uh, you go through the comment section and you'll start seeing familiar avatars and such of the people that you're used to. So owning your face is going to become very important for building your personal brand and under people understanding who you are. Finally, owning your reputation. Now this isn't going to be so important for the average Joe, I'm nobody special. Um, I'm not a Mark Schaefer who has people blogging about him, who has publications writing about him. But if you are uh, in that celebrity category, I'm not the Kevin Jonas, right? Um, you're going to want to own your, your reputation by setting up things like Google Alerts and such. But really, your reputation here is the way that you act on social media. So I say voice here. This means that I don't care how professional your LinkedIn profile is. If you curse like a pirate on Twitter, it's not going to be consistent and unfortunately HR managers and other people who would be looking into you don't just stop at Google. They will be checking multiple profiles that you do have. So it's important to have a consistent voice that you'd have to develop for yourself across multiple channels. This also goes into small things, guys, like owning your email address, okay? If uh, you're applying for a job and you're sending it from XOX Hottie Baby 23 XO California at gmail.com, not really the best for your personal brand, okay? I had to delete that email alias a long time ago. We missed one. And then finally, owning the conversations about you. So this is things like setting up Google Alerts that you'll be uh, prompted whenever somebody does uh, mention you online or Google does pick that up. Now I put a lot of bullet points and such in here because guys, I will tell you, it's taken me four years to get where I'm at. This is not easy. Uh, I'm not gonna have a picture and just explain to you guys what the roots and decaying roots means about personal branding. I really want you guys to be writing this stuff down because I really feel like this could help you out. Next we're going to move into building your personal brand. So after securing your personal brand, let's learn how to build it. So you really have three different choices here. The first two choices, okay, you've heard of content curation, correct? Great. Okay, the thing with personal branding here too, guys, is even if you're not interested in personal branding, a lot of these same aspects are relatable to business brands. So you can take a lot of this information and incorporate it into your own business. Um, then you go into the creation side, okay, which is consistently creating and sharing unique, relevant content with your audience. So one thing that really uh, makes you unique and takes away from just adding to the noise, if you are simply curating good content, that's valuable to your audience. But giving your own personal take on things, creating your own type of content, creating a blog, creating a video YouTube series, these are things that are going to set you apart from the competition. Again, guys, this is not easy. And as you saw from uh, Rand's graph earlier about the difficulties of content and what good content is, um, it's good to reference here too as far as thinking about what type of content you'll create. Another good point on this is when I first started my blog back in uh, college as a college, uh, yeah, I was a college 
term like final to create a blog, which is pretty cool. Aced it. Um, I was writing about everything on my blog from what classes I was in, uh, my favorite pizza recipe, all of these different things. And what I found there is I sat back and I said, well, if I'm really trying to develop my personal brand and grow my audience and community, why would somebody follow my blog, subscribe to my RSS feed and email list if they had no idea what they could expect from me every time I hit publish? So what I did essentially is I became what you call a click, boom, hybrid. A hybrid personal brand, which is essentially creating and curating mixture. So I started creating my own content, which I'll get into. Um, but you see the 60-20-20 here, okay? A lot of the times you might hear it's the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 other relevant content that your audience and fan bases would be interested in, 20% your own sales and branding messaging. I think that's missing something, okay? So I broke it up like this. 60% other relevant industry-based uh, content that'll help your audience and that they'll appreciate and share. 20%, of course, you need to be selling or doing something, whether it's applying for a job or whatever the case is, or your own messaging. Uh, that also goes into uh, posting personal messages. So maybe uploading a picture of you at Niagara Falls on vacation that you also incorporate into, say, things like your Twitter feed. Uh, and then the other remaining 20% here, which I feel is very overlooked and which has been touched on a lot and you've, hear, you've heard from Mark a lot, uh, Mark Schaefer, is the whole engagement side of it. The follow-up, the follow-through, not just saying, hey, thanks for the retweet, thanks for the share. It's actually taking that extra time uh, to go ahead and follow up, dig a little bit deeper into the people uh, that you want to be finding more about and that you think are strategically going to be beneficial to connect with and finding out more about them, helping them and engaging. So I feel like this 60-20-20 rule is probably the best bet for what you want to be doing. So I became a hybrid personal brand, okay? Uh, and this is essentially what you should be doing. Create. Find a niche and do it better, okay? This is the whole create the right content. Uh, Rand Fishkin calls it the 10 times. So create as best content as you can. Um, Contribute, okay? So this goes into things like uh, joining Twitter chats or uh, contributing as a guest poster on an, a popular blog or things like uh, even commenting on uh, an influencer's blog that you're trying to um, reach to. So guest blog and comment. Next is compare, and I'm not saying compare as far as think of yourself as comparing against somebody else that's extremely popular or somebody who's been doing this a really long time. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many people have up to 500 Twitter followers, okay? Up to 1,000, 3,000 Twitter followers. Keep your hands up if you got it. 5,000, 10, 20. You in the back, I finally got you down. Good job. How many you got in the back? Blickly blau, man. Good job. Um, okay, so comparing doesn't mean comparing against your competitors, really. Uh, it's just comparing your results based upon the type of content you're producing. So I found that people were not following me organically because I was posting about my pizza sauce recipe. Uh, but what I found is that when I changed that, I tracked my progress, and I finally changed it to make sure that I was providing content that was valuable, that I was managing my audience's expectations so that they could always come back to. The, the one other one here is commit, okay? This is huge. A lot of businesses right now and personal branding advocates and individuals, um, everyone's all about, let's get as many, all the fans, right? Like, let's get as many fans as possible. Uh, the problem here is that once you do that, uh, everyone's trying to build uh, communities. They're not trying to maintain communities. Uh, they think once they get those numbers, uh, that's it. And they just kind of push them off into the converted fan uh, demographic. But you really need to commit. This goes into relationships and frequency, and this is a lot of what Mark talked about too. He stole a lot of the notes from me, by the way. I'm just joking. Uh, other than that, so this is what I did, okay guys? I created a, my niche was probably one of the most saturated you could choose, social media tutorials. If you Google social media tutorials, my site will appear on the first page, I think at one or two result. Um, so what I did essentially is I tried to do that 10X factor of really good content. Ran had mentioned that a lot of the time you might see that, um, the ad hoc or very um, not necessarily professionally polished content does very well. But what I did is I was I, I researched tutorials and I found that why would somebody watch a six minute tutorial on how to change your Twitter username? Why would somebody and, and I was finding that the production quality and people doing this was just not uh, a standard that I feel people would replicate and share. So essentially what I did is I started to do, do, do this. I created a tutorial series called the Social Media Minute. You could search that. It's also on YouTube and also on jacobcurtis.com. 
this clicker. So next we're going to move into building relationships, okay? And this is kind of what Mark talked about too, which is just so funny, okay? His whole, uh, his whole story about the, the, late, the girl who got in touch with him about uh, football and how it led into so much more. Uh, the first thing you need to do when building relationships is become a fan of that person. Okay, this isn't, uh, this isn't you meet them the first day and it'd be so odd if you met them, shook their hand and said, hey, can I guest blog for you? Or hey, buy my product. It's that same sort of thing. So what you'd want to do here is pick two or three industry role models. I can be one of them, guys. Uh, you're going to then want to be patient, okay? As Mark said, uh, start small. Don't go after the big fish right now. Uh, remember Rand was saying to scroll down the list of those influencers you're trying to outreach? Because a lot of the time they're getting hit up so much, they're not really going to pay attention to you. However, these people who do build their Twitter audience, and I'm saying Twitter specifically because that's my favorite platform and the time I've invested the most time in, um, but starting small actually allows you to build up your network uh, healthy and, and keeps you sane because you're not getting all caught up because that influencer didn't follow you back. Be consistent with the type of content you create so you can have a frequency that your audience will enjoy. And then finally, uh, become a friend. So that means providing value and initiating contact. One story, right? So Mark was talking about Jay Bear, uh, his good friend. Um, I followed Jay Bear like a year ago. Didn't follow me back, right? Oops, that sucks. So what I did, right? I was trolling on the internet, on, on Twitter, and I saw that Jay Bear was going to be a guest on a Twitter chat. Everyone familiar with Twitter chats? It's like a scheduled time with a hashtag that people talk about, industry talk. Look them up, they're awesome. Uh, Jay Bear was going to be a guest. So I started to uh, engage in the Twitter chat. There was just a few people there, even better. The whole thing was, I knew Jay Bear was going to be there in person, aka online, but at that time, and that was my time to make that connection. So during the Twitter chat, I started to put my answers to the questions. Uh, Jay Bear was still not following me, but I was following Jay Bear. So what I did is I unfollowed Jay Bear. And I provided value during the Twitter chat. And he said, he started to retweet my stuff. And I was like, wow, Jay, thanks, man. How about a follow? He looked at me, didn't know that, looked at my profile, showed that I was uh, not following him. So I followed him within the Twitter chat. So it was a fresh new follow and he saw me and then he followed me right away. So these are things that you can do now. Go for the ask, guys. Find those tricky ways. They don't follow you first, unfollow them. Find out where they're going to be, provide value, follow them back, and that's just one tricky way to get that follow. So I got that follow. And I'll tell you why these follows are important in a little bit. Boom, 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 boom. All right, who wants to make friends? Who wants to learn how to make friends on Twitter? Who wants more Twitter followers? Yeah, good. Okay, now again, this can go from business to individual. So let's talk about building relationships on Twitter. The first thing you're going to want to do is pick a target. If there was any time that you should be writing down stuff, this is it. You're going to want to pick a target. This is Brian Fanzo. Anybody familiar with Brian? Okay, you should be. This guy's really awesome. Um, essentially what this is, is this is Twitterland.com. For those of you online currently, you can go ahead and pull this up and follow along with what I'm doing at this time. Uh, but what Twitterland will do, and this is something that Ran had mentioned as well. Uh, it, that follower wonk actually does that we'll be getting into. But what you'll want to do is pick one target. So I picked Brian. You'll see here it says talked with. This is essentially where you could see the different type of conversation and who Brian engages with the most. So let's just say it's his friends. Next you're going to secure your target's follow back. Okay guys, this is just about being nice. It's about being attentive and trying to get that person to follow you, okay? Find the opportunities. I found Jay Bear during the Twitter chat. List them on Twitter. Comment on their blogs. Attend or promote their webinars or a podcast. These are just things that get you uh, in front of them and helps build up a name to face recognition. Oh man, I'm going to go too far. So this is a thing I'm talking about committing to, right? It's one thing to generate those opportunities for yourself. It's actually another thing to go ahead and uh, capitalize on those opportunities and take advantage of them. AKA when Mark said, Jacob, you haven't guest blocked for me yet. Oops, I'm working on it. Um, here you see Brian, okay? This is Brian back August 25th. Uh, during one of the Twitter chats we had uh, and we just started talking about personal branding and employee advocacy. He said, hey man, like, sounds like we're on top of the same thing. We should do a Google Hangout sometime. He's really popular on Google+. Plus. Um, and about f six months later, here I am right there doing a Google Hangout with Brian Fanzo, the person I had just picked as my target. So again, following up with Brian, doing things like retweeting his content. I now have guest blog on his website as well. 
So next, step three, for those of you following along, we need to convert their friends, okay? Uh, and this is, you'll see why this is important in a little bit later. So find their friends using Twitterland, what I just showed you. Engage with their friend, make friends, and you're really gonna want the end goal here is to get that friend to follow you. And I'll show you why that's so important. So within Twitterland, you'll go ahead and after clicking on Brian's profile, you'll see his network. And these are the top three people the list goes on for a long time. These are the three people that tw Brian engages with the most. I know Rachel Mil Miller because she also co-hosts the Twitter chats with him, so she was going to be an easy next friend for me to convert that follow. So I got Rachel to follow me. Next, what I did is I displayed my social proof, okay? This means things like setting up visual cues. There's a lot of psychology that goes on to in, to in community building. And so what this is essentially is a mostly cosmetic feature. This is exactly what it looks like. Now. I went ahead and had my professional bio here, my screen, my uh, headshot. What you'll see here is, here's Brian, he's speaking a little bit later, but here's Brian Fanzo, here's Rachel after they have both followed me. Hey, what's up, Brian? Perfect timing. Um, what I did here now, okay, is I set up a pinned tweet saying that I engage with Brian, okay? Now, here's where we get into it. Now, everybody wants to grow their Twitter following, but nobody really knows how to start. The best way to grow your Twitter following is by following people. It's a good following strategy. It's kind of like knocking on the door and saying like, hello. You should always be following your target audience. So here's what this looks like. Oh my. This is follower wonk. So this is exactly what Rand was talking about earlier on. Now, here's what I did, okay? I have Rachel following me. I have Brian following me. When people go to my profile that are following Brian or Rachel, they now see that Rachel follows Jacob. It's almost like social proof saying, hey, this guy's cool, you should probably follow him too. So now, how do I use that information to follow the right people? What you're gonna do is you're going to go into the compare user section on follower wonk, okay? I put in my name, Brian's, and Rachel's. I'm, I'm not hearing a lot of ahs and wows and oohs. Does anybody know what this means? Can anybody get this graph right here? It says, these are all of my followers. These are all of Brian's. And these are all of Rachel's. Still blank. Can anybody tell me what this section right here is? These are people, close, these are people who follow Brian and Rachel, but not me, yet. It's an overlap in an area that these are the people following these two accounts, but not following you. So that basically is followers only of iSocialFans and Rachel Miller, about 1,400. This is how I've built up my Twitter profile with targeted users that have led to opportunities, okay? This does take a lot of manual work, but believe me, you're going to thank yourself when you have 35,000 followers that aren't random garbage. Um, now the whole thing is you're going to want to find the overlap and follow these users because they're more likely to follow you back. The whole reason I had my pinned tweet of Brian's I never fell in love with a billboard thing is because when those users now went to my profile, they could see that Brian and I engage on a regular basis. Do you see how we're using friendships and social proof to leverage followbacks? Yes, good. Okay, great. Because I'm a nobody, guys. I was Jacob Curtis, 2011, baby dunking as far as anybody knew. Um, so once you open that up, you're going to see this is the same picture that Rand showed. You can scroll down and you can see their social authority days old. One thing I would recommend starting off small is go down smaller. Uh, find somebody who has the same social authority as you. You can do a search for yourself on Follower Wonk and find that out. But really look at their ratios as well too. If they have a ratio where it's uh, you know 10,000 followers and they're only following two people, it's very likely you're not want to go, going to go after that person because it's very unlikely they'll follow you. But through this account and follower wonk, you can then click follow and do about, I think it's about 90 to 150 people per day. So again, very manual guys, but what do you either want it done right, fast or cheap or something like that. So this is the way to be doing it right, displaying that social proof and whatever connections you do make, make sure to retain, uh, maintain. Leveraging your personal brand. What time do I go to? Two? Time is up. Time is up. All right. Leveraging your personal brand. I'm glad because this is my last slide. This is 2011, guys. This is, look at this little baby face. Look at this little monitor in the back from his desk at work, not knowing what a profile picture should look like. This is uh, Andrea Valls. She uh, helped co-author the Facebook marketing book for dummies. Um, 
small time speaker, you know, minor celebrity in the social media sphere. Uh, so I started guest blogging for her, okay? I started connecting with Andrea, sharing her content. She was one of my first guest blogs back in 2011. That really helped me develop my personal brand and my courage to continue to go after this. Now, Andrea Vall also works for Social Media uh, Examiner. So what I did now, so here's April 1st, 2015. Jacob Curtis, eight ways Twitter chats can benefit your business. Here I am on one of the most top uh, popular social media blogs in the world. Uh, instead of getting a couple shares, I'm now getting thousands, 5.3 thousand. Uh, this was my first blog for them. Essentially guys, all I'm trying to say is that this happens over time. This happened in 2011 when I first met with Andrea, guest blog for her. Since then, uh, I get what, Gary Vanderchuk does that jab, jab, right hook. You gotta just, you know, build up, build up that ask before you actually ask for it. So that's, I'm out of time. And as the MC, I should have shut myself up a long time ago. But this is essentially how I did it, guys. Uh, what can you do with your personal brand, network, complement your resume, generate opportunities, alleviate search anxiety, help others or causes, start your own business, and that's exactly what I did. So who is Jacob Curtis now? I'm no longer some baby who's jacobcurtis.com. I am Jacob Curtis. Thank you.